I will share the screen. Why is it saying one? Oh, this is definitely okay. I have the chat open, so okay. So we are all good. So, as I normally say, anybody have any questions on anything before we start? So uh, there was a discussion before class or start of class, I should say, um, talking about tests. Uh, so there's one more chapter, chapters test uh, that's coming up. And then the final, final separate, final is cumulative. The next test is just uh, chapter 19, 20, and 21. Uh, although material is getting easier, at least in my opinion, I, I mean, like when I took the class and when I teach it, I, I think things get easier, at least for what I've observed with the students, you know, it's like once you're over asses and base, this, this class is just kind of a, it's kind of like you're, you're jogging downhill. I mean, it's still, you're still working out when you're jogging downhill, but it's just a lot easier. It's, um, it's a pretty rude smack in the face, I think, in the beginning of the semester. You know, kind of thing. This class. <laughs> Welcome to chemistry too. <laughs> Come for your slap across the face. <laughs> so, so now it's it's more of an encouraging, encouraging coaching downhill. You can do it. You can do it. So, and uh, as I mentioned, you know, and being recorded, uh, if you score better on the final, you get the score on your final exam. So like you get B's in the, in the tests and an A in the final, you get an A in the class. So, uh, but the opposite is not true. If you get uh, like, you know, B's in the class and C in the final, it, the final could drop your grade down. But usually that, that rarely happens. Students either perform the same or they perform higher. And if you guys haven't noticed that if, if you perform worse, I usually come and talk to you and like, hey, what happened? <laughs> and then, and then uh, if you've noticed, I, I keep the, uh, I get, let me, where's the record button? Anyway, I do have to submit grades. I, I do have to submit grades by um, whatever it is, the, the Monday or something like that. So there has to be a grade in, but uh, it can be, it can be, you know, any grade and can be changed. Actually changing grades are a lot easier now. It used to be a pain in the butt. You have to have to file paperwork. Now you just have to do some stuff online. But anyways, yeah, so. Any other questions while well, I'm talking about the, the nature of the course? Any questions about where we're going, the nature of the class, what we're doing? Okay, so what we are doing, we're doing electrochemistry. And uh, last class, I spent the whole class teaching a very specific skill, how to balance oxidation reduction reactions. And they're weird because you're counting electrons. So uh, now we're gonna get into the heart of electrochemistry and where I think it's cool, where I, where if you, you know, wondering why is this guy get a PhD in chemistry and why am I always so excited to talk about chemistry? I think it's cool how everything is connected. So uh, not, not this class, but next classes, the, um, the, the, the potential, the, the, the voltage, the, the potential uh, electro um, motive force potential, this also equals the, uh, the Gibbs energy and the Gibbs energy is also equilibrium. So this is interesting, you know, like how connected everything is that, that the electricity uh, and magnetism drives the energy, drives the equilibrium and vice versa. The equilibrium drives the electricity and magnetism. So these are all connected and the equilibrium drives a concentration. So concentration, electricity, magnetism, and therefore electricity and magnetism is also light and radiation. So light and radiation is connected to concentration, is connected to energy, everything is all connected. That's amazing, this is, this is awesome. So that's the stuff that I think is really cool, among other things. Uh, and uh, for other classes, for physics, uh, I mean, chemistry, chemistry is just kind of like an applied physics, if you will, or kind of a subset of physics, we study matter, you know, kind of thing. But um, we haven't been able to, connect other physics concepts. We haven't been able to connect electricity and magnetism to gravity 
yet. So that's, those are the big hurdles we have. We don't have a connection between gravity and electricity and magnetism. So electricity and magnetism, we have a connection there to lights. We have a connection to energy. We have a connection to concentration. So those are all connected. And we have it proved and figured out. We don't have gravity figured out how it connects to that. And we don't have uh, dark energy figured out. We don't even know what dark energy, we don't even know what dark matter is. Dark matter, dark energy, that's why I call it dark. It's just, we don't know. So we don't have that connected. We don't have that figured out yet. So maybe in the future, but I always think it's kind of cool, exciting, but okay. So coming back to electrochemistry and I'm going to show you something you're very familiar with. This is a battery. So here are some features of the battery, and this is a specific battery. Uh, this is going to be a zinc and copper battery, and this is also a standard cell. So this is a standard voltaic, sometimes referred to as a galvanic, galvanic, voltaic, interchangeably, a standard, what does the book call it? Voltaic, okay. So standard voltaic cell. And in your standard cell, you have a few things. First of all, your temperature is 25 degrees Celsius. Uh, secondly, you have a one molar solution of zinc ions and you're on one side, and you have a one molar of copper ions on the other side. And you also have a metal strip of, of zinc and a metal strip of copper. And uh, so, with a battery, with any battery, you have the, the plus sign, the, the plus end. The plus end is known as the cathode. So the cathode is the plus end, and then you, oh, it is labeled there. The, the anode is the negative end. So uh, how it goes by electricity wise, the cathode is the source of positive charge. The anode is the source of negative charge. So the idea with electricity is the, well, we have it wrong and we know we have it wrong. The, the, when you write a battery diagram in an electrical, electrical diagram, you have the current flow. The current flow is the positive charge moves toward the negative charge. So of course that's wrong. Actually the, the charge that's moving is the negative charge. The electrons move. So uh, let me, you might see these in other classes. And so here is an example of a circuit diagram. So you said, are you taking circuits now or is it next semester? Next semester. Okay. Have you taken circuits? Yeah, yeah. Uh, how about you, Kiana? Have you studied circuits at all? Nope. Nope. Okay. So uh, I'm pointing at the battery, BAT, that's the battery. And you have a long end and a short end. Okay, so the long end is the cathode. It's the source of positive charge. And the smaller end is the battery, is, is, is the negative end. And when you do a circuit, and here's a simple circuit, uh, you have the positive charge flows towards the negative charge. And why do we have it that way? If, if I were to guess, um, I don't know if you ever worked on your car battery before, but when you take off the positive terminal, it sparks. So if you've ever noticed that, the, the positive terminal is the one that sparks. Negative terminal, it's not a big deal. You can grab it, you know, you can grab the negative terminal, you can, you know, brush your teeth and hold on to the negative terminal, it's not a big deal. But you start grabbing the positive terminal, you can get shocked, it'll, it'll spark at you, you know, kind of thing. So. Uh, I think, and the person that started doing this was Ben Franklin, so one of our founding fathers, he was a scientist, as well as the United States founding father, and, and, and uh, I think he guessed it by the fact the positive uh, terminal is the one that, that sparks. That, that's, that's my own uh, guess, but he's the one, he, um, he, he thought that the positive charges move toward the negative, and, and I mean, he, he didn't know which one it was, and so he guessed, and he guessed wrong. And, you know, uh, then he set everything up for the positive charges moving toward the negative, and later on we found out that it's actually the negative charges move toward the positives, and did we change our equations and, and push everything back? And the answer is no. When we make mistakes, we stick with them because we're humans, 
right? Why should we change something just because we know it's wrong? So, and so every time you look at a circuit diagram, it's fundamentally incorrect. So, but we know it's wrong and we just, we've just continued with all our mistakes so much that it's become right, kind of sort of. But it, it, I mean, it works out. I mean, like it shows you among other things like a circuit diagram and math, they're models, they're models. And as long as we understand how the model works, then it does its job. So, uh, so a couple of things also with electricity. So uh, this, this squiggly line, so I'm going the top over to the right, you have a squiggly line, that's known as a resistor. So a resistor, a resistor is something that resists the flow of electricity. And of course, the way we have it set up is the positive charges. A resistor resists the flow of the positive charges. So uh, then uh, you have uh, these two lines. So it has a C next to it, uh, like on the opposite side of the battery, that is a capacitor. So what is a capacitor? So uh, a battery, so the battery is the source of the, the electricity, source of the current flow. And imagine the current flow as like a cars. So imagine you're driving cars on the road and like a resistor is kind of like something like, like a linchpin, like if you're, I guess we don't really have this here, but like say, like if you're driving, if you're driving across, have you guys driven across the United States before, like in the country? Like, you know, you haven't, okay. Like if you're on the interstate, you're driving, you're driving fast, it's nice and smooth. Suddenly you come to a small town and you're on the freeway, but now you have stop signs and traffic lights and traffic and it slows down. A bunch of cars get together and honk their horns. So that's kind of like a resistor. So the, the wire is sort of like the freeway, like the, the, the car, the, the electrons. I mean, I know it's supposed to be the positive charge, but the, the imaginary positive electrons are driving on the freeway. They get to a traffic jam, that's a resistor. And the capacitor, a capacitor is something that stores charge. Think of it like a parking lot. So, so you're driving along and then you get to a capacitor. A capacitor is just something that stores a lot of charge. So it'd be like if, if cars were charge moving particles, a, a capacitor would be like a parking lot. And uh, then, uh, so you can think of a battery, think of a battery like a car factory, like a Ford plant is making cars and cars are spitting out and you make it maybe, you know, spit out 10 cars a day out of the factory, but a capacitor, you can, you can store a thousand cars in a parking lot. And so when you need to have a sudden source of a lot of electricity real fast, a capacitor is great. So like um, the flash button on, on a camera, for instance, comes from a capacitor. So how can you suddenly have, you have a battery, you know, that, that uh, supplies energy to your camera. Uh, and I know we have cell phones now and they don't, they don't really have true flashes on these. They, they're just, it's just an LED. But if you, if you, do you remember like a, gosh, am I showing my age here? Like, remember when we actually had cameras and not cell phones. And when you like, when people would take a picture, there would be a flash, you know, like the, um, so why, why isn't that flash? Why can't we have that flash on all the time? It's because the battery doesn't have enough power. So how do we get a lot of power in a really short sprint? A capacitor. So the battery, the, the, um, the, the flash is run off of a capacitor. So the battery can fill the capacitor slowly and then suddenly lots of energy at once. So that's a capacitor. And so then um, some other symbols I have here on the right and blue, that's a ground. So uh, it's also sometimes referred to as the earth. So um, earth or ground, uh, what, what, uh, what's the purpose of a ground? It's safety. So like your, your car, your car doesn't have a true ground, um, but uh, we, we have grounds here, like grounded things here in, in like, um, well, most places have grounds. Not every, not every country has grounds. Here in the United States, we have a ground. Um, electricity flows along the path of least resistance. So if you, and we humans, we're resistors, okay? 
So what the, what the purpose of a ground is, is to give um, an alternate pathway that uh, electricity can flow so that if, if you have an event, you can, the electricity can go towards the ground and not, not just, just flow towards some crazy resistor like a human or, or something else that's that in the circuit that you don't want to damage. Uh, sometimes you might see this squiggly line here on the bottom, that's an inductor. Uh, what, what an inductor essentially is, is you take uh, a, a conductor, something like usually like a piece of iron, and you just wrap wires around it. That's why it's squiggly, because the, the original inductors were literally an iron rod with wires wrapped around it. And what an inductor does uh, when the current flows through that, it induces magnetism. It, in, it induces a magnetic field through the, uh, through through the um, the area and I mean among other things that's that's how um, electrical machines work is that they uh, you have you have an inductor and it creates magnetism and then the repelling of the magnetism causes like the the gears to turn so it's like an instant it's like an instantaneous magnet so the magnets turn off and on using electricity and then you can get things to move so and I know I'm, I'm making this very very simple and uh, with all the circuits as they flow, you have to have the battery connected such that the positive charge can flow towards the negative terminal. So if you break the connection anywhere, the, the circuit just won't go. It, and uh, that's what switches do. So if you, if you flip the switch, if you cut the wire, you flip the switch, you can, you can break the circuit, the, the electrical circuit doesn't go. So, and some other things with, uh, with uh, circuits uh, and what they and you've probably seen some of these equations before. So let me erase this. Uh, I'm sure you've heard of a voltage before. Uh, the units on voltage I can write out the volts, the voltage. Volt was a scientist, got a term named after him. So the voltage is energy joules per coulomb and what is coulomb coulomb is a is a term of charge and maybe you've heard of the amperage before so amperage and amp so one amp one ampere of of uh currents is a charge coulomb that's the that's the si unit the, the metric system unit for charge it's one coulomb per second. So think of an analogy, think of electricity, think of it like water. So water flows, electricity flows. Uh, think of your current. Your current is like how much water. So like imagine you have a stream of water and it's flowing. The, the current would be like how much water is flowing. And the voltage would be like how much energy each of the water molecules have it's the potential. It's like so. So we have a stream that's flowing, and the current is how much water is flowing, and then the the potential of that the, the voltage would be like the the uh, how much energy each of the water molecules has as it's flowing. So uh, I mean I, I know here on Earth uh, water tends to flow. There's, there's not a very big difference in how much energy. Um, water has as it's flowing in a in a stream versus a river, you know, because I mean, there it's all powered by gravity going downhill. But I mean, it, like imagine uh, imagine like a little trickly stream versus like a fire hose, you know, like the fire hose has lots and lots of power. Like the the, the stream of water coming out of the fire hose is really strong. It'll knock you over, kind of thing. And meanwhile, you know, I can in a stream, I can just, I can leisurely just walk along a stream, no big deal, you know. But when fire hose, you know, I'm knocked over. So the the fire hose uh, is like a little, not a lot of current, so not a lot of water, but the water's got a lot of energy, a lot of power. So that's the idea of voltage. And in like a, a little calming stream, you can have you have a big stream, you can have a lot of amperage, a lot of current but not much potential, not much voltage. I'm even using the word potential. And some other, some other terms. So 
so power uh, in a circuit. So um, I don't know how much uh, physics you've had, and this is not on the test, but I'm I'm trying to get you to to see the connection between electricity and in this class coming up. So uh, a power that the power uh, in electricity is watts. Well, a power everywhere is watts, or horsepower if you if you uh, or if you're using the, the American system. So the power is watts. It's it's energy per time, is power. So the power is your voltage times your current. So uh, and voltage is joules per coulomb. So uh, so power is joules per coulomb, uh, energy per charge, and then uh, the the current is coulombs per second. It's the amount of charge per time. And then so voltage times current is joules per second. Joules per second is a watt. So watt is power. So what is the difference between energy and power? So um, power is the derivative with respect to time to, to energy. So what does that mean? Uh, so more power means more energy more quickly. Uh, so like, um, I remember my first car was a, a Honda, or not a Honda, a Nissan Sentra. Nissan Sentra, it was, um, well, I can say this, I guess. I, we, we used, my friends, they called it the shit box because it was just, it was not a very fancy car. It was, it was a black car. It was 10 years old. It had four tires and it got you from point A to point B and usually home. You know, it was not a very glamorous car. It was a, my first car, bought it used, you know, kind of thing. Lots of lots of interesting issues on it. I learned I learned a bit about how to change brakes, how to change a fuel pump, and and all sorts of you know practical skills having a you know a rundown used car. But uh, a Nissan Sentra weighs about the same as like a Porsche, right? And what's the difference between a Nissan Sentra, you know, old Nissan Sentra? with lots of problems and a Porsche. Like, well, I mean, since they weigh about the same, uh, if you're going 60 miles an hour in a Sentra and 60 mile an hour in a Porsche, you really, you have the same energy, same, same, uh, same mass, same velocity. And, and kinetic energy is one half mass times velocity squared. So the amount of energy in a Nissan Sentra and a Porsche traveling at the same speed is exactly the, is more or less the same but a porsche has a lot more power so why is it more powerful what does that mean it means that a nissan sentra can get from well my i'll say my sentra that i had it can get from zero to 60 in like two minutes right where a porsche can do it in like five seconds you know so it's it's energy divided by time Right, so, so two minutes is 120 seconds, you know, and, and I'm just making these numbers up, right? Versus five seconds, so that means that the uh, the Porsche is 24 times as is um, powerful as a Sentra. I mean, I don't know if those numbers are correct, but I'm just I'm illustrating that that you know that's why a Porsche is more fun to drive. It's more cool, you know, because among other things, it's it's powerful. Well, what do you mean it's powerful? It means lots of energy real fast. So that's that's power, that's watts. So uh, when you have your circuit, it's your, so coming back from moving from cars to electrical circuits, your, your voltage, your potential uh, times the current, the amperage equals the power. And uh, not necessarily for this class, but for other classes, right, that power, uh, is what you want to use for for driving things, you know. It's what you that's when you use the 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 electricity then to do work. So as it's moving, you can have it do work, and work is energy. Work and energy are interchangeable, and work divided by time, that's power. So depending on your application, right? I mean, power is important, right? I mean, if uh, you know, like, okay, you know, I'm. If I can, I can get this energy up to, I can, I can increase the, I can get the water to boil to 100 degrees and 
And if I have a little bit of energy trickling away, it's going to take forever to get to 100 degrees. Versus more power, it's it's heats right up real fast. So that's hopefully those uh, those kind of make sense. And and then uh, anybody have any quick questions about anything? Okay, so our our plugs also. So when you when you look at the the plugs that we have here in the United States, uh, and I've drawn it for emphasis, but um, the uh, uh, I mean, of course, this is this is alternating current. The uh, this this battery diagram is with direct current. So, what's the difference between alternating current and direct current? The um, the the uh, it changes directions. It basically, it's uh, the uh, we haven't talked about electromotive force yet, but the the force pushing it changes directions with alternating current. And here in the United States, we have 60 hertz, so 60 times a second. In Europe, they have 50 hertz, 50 times a second. So it's the similar, so the electricity coming from the wall using that alternating current, it's basically the same as direct current, but it's changing directions uh, 60 times a second. And the, uh, the small wire, uh, usually the black wire, uh, the black wire uh, in the plugs, uh, the small wire, that's also known as your hot wire. That's typically the source of the positive charge. The bigger wire, that's also known as a neutral. You can think of it as the source of a negative charge. And then the big, the big one, that's the ground. So uh, although uh, it's, remember, it's alternating current, so uh, uh, if you grab the hot wire in, in your electrical circuit, it's going to shock you. So uh, remember, alternating current has different rules than direct current. Whereas if you, if you have a, uh, a, um, just a plain old battery, uh, under certain circumstances, you can electrify yourself with the, with the positive wire and be fine. And it's not only until you connect to the, the negative wire that the electricity can flow. So, although that's not recommended, you know, but it's possible for you to, to be isolated enough that you can electrify yourself with the positive terminal of the battery and not be shocked. So, but it's also for humans, uh, our resistance is, is um, or we, we need to have a potential of at least uh, 60 volts typically. So we're, we're insulators and our insulation is usually around 60 volts. So if you get a, if you're less than 60 volts, you should be okay. Um, but I've never done this experiment, at least not knowingly. A, pair, a car battery is 12 volts. I've never touched both terminals to see what would happen. So, um, but uh, people tell me you don't necessarily get shocked if you do that. But I don't want to find out, you know, kind of thing. Uh, so. Uh, different different countries have different plugs, you know, different different wires, and uh, so uh, and also different different um, applications. So the uh, frequently uh, for electrical trains, for instance, uh, the electrical trains that the tracks themselves are the negative wire. So uh, so that's one of the things I tell people: don't touch the tracks on the subway. You know, like because. It could be the negative wire. If it's not properly grounded, it can shock you. So kind of thing. It depends, depends on the circumstance. And uh, so, and I know we have, I don't know how much you've traveled internationally. Um, I know like some places they just have, the plugs are just that. One's, one's positive, one's neutral. One's hot, uh, hot pot. Usually for alternate current, you call the, the one that, that flows the current, we call it the hot wire. And then the, the negative term we call the neutral, the neutral wire. Or it could be like my house. I, um, the builder that built my house, uh, I, was, I was installing the lights uh, in, my, in my house after it was built. And, and for whatever reason, the contractor decided to have all the wires black. It pissed me off. So all the wires are black and, and like, because normally what every other one else does is have the wires be black, the, the hot wire black and the, and the, um, 
the neutral wire white. And not only that, whoever uh, wired my house um, did not do it consistently. So all the, the switches, for instance, in my house, they were, they were just, um, they were put in randomly. So meaning that one switch had the hot wire in one place and the neutral in the other, and the other switch had them, and on the same circuit too. They, I mean, because 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 uh, usually when you flip the switch, then the, the electricity should you like, oh, it goes the same way and they connect it up. Oh, you'd think they do it the same time each way. And it turns out that assumption was wrong. So I remember um, trying to wire my house and I'm like, um, I, I, cause uh, I mean, I was, I was, uh, you've, you haven't seen me in lab, but I'm, I'm the overly cautious type, you know, kind of when it comes to, I got, I mean, when I work on my car, I wear safety glasses. So just, you know, I'm that guy, you know, I'm always very, very, very cautious. And when I was, when I was working on my house, doing the wiring, trying to, I mean, I wasn't doing the wiring, but I was trying to connect things to the wiring, like basically lights. And, and so what I would do, you know, I went my, I, um, I turned off the, uh, the, the fuse box or whatever, you know, the, the is that the, it's still called the fuse box? I don't know. Is it, but the circuit box, I, I closed the circuit, you know, and I, would bring out the uh, the switch and I would look at the wires. I'm like, I don't know which, I'm like, at first I was like, they're all black. I'm like, crud, you know, which one is which? So I brought my multimeter, you know, and, and had it set up and, and you know, and, and had the, and I connected it up, uh, like put put what I thought was a hot wire around one terminal and the, the neutral on the other and set the multimeter to the AC term and, you know, because because uh, if you we have 120 volts here, so it's 120 volts coming in, in our 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 walls. So and I wouldn't turn the circuit back on and and like okay, I had it backwards. So like okay, so actually this is the the hot, this is the neutral. And so then when I was putting the thing together, and then I'm like okay, I go to the next switch and like, you know, I better check it. Maybe they did it backwards. You know, I don't know who would do that, why they would do that, but I better check it and. I checked it. I was like, sure enough, nope, they're all random. So I was angry because then I had to go through and I had to check each circuit each time before I would hook it up. So um, just be careful, you know, like, so if you are going to work with electricity, be careful. I was doing that for two days. I didn't get shocked. <laughs> so um, I've been shocked worse than 120 volts. But man, man, has anyone ever been shocked before with like some Nope. Oh yeah, that's that's the it's a static. That's nothing. Yeah, I mean that's that's actually um, that's fairly high uh, potential, but low low current. So, uh, and I guess when it comes we can talk about that with power, uh, voltage times current. Uh, so, you can actually have fairly high uh, you. To, to shock a human, you have to have over 60 volts, typically speaking. You have a potential of higher than 60 volts. Uh, but the, um, the current uh, depends on the current and uh, resistance, uh, the ohms, the, well, the, the, uh, the power that comes from a resistor, um, it's drawn by current. The higher the current, the more, the, the more there, they'll be resisting. So actually, uh, higher potential doesn't resist as much. So, but anyways, uh, if, uh, so since we're resistors, um, if you have high potential, but not a lot of currents, it doesn't generate that much heat and electrical, like electricity, the, the burn actually is the, da the danger is from burning. You will, you will cook yourself internally with electricity. So, but if you have higher currents, that'll really cook you. That, that, uh, that can cause, uh, some major damage and some of the issues with electrical damage like well burns internal burns i mean um external burns were actually pretty well uh to take care of i mean like our bodies seemed i don't say they respond well to it but it's kind of like okay i'm burned i know how to do with deal with this but an internal burn be like i feel fine meanwhile you know my liver is fried or something like that or you know like 
kind of thing. So internal burns can be, you know, they, they, like, I feel fine, but actually I'm dying, you know, kind of thing. So you have to be very careful. And, and like, you know, when you have an external burn, it's really obvious, like, see this red puffy part on my arm, that's a burn, you know, kind of thing. Whereas internally, it's what's going on. So uh, your body's not sure. So that's one of the issues with electricity. Uh, the most I've ever been shocked was about a thousand volts. I um, luckily it was it was a little bit of current. Um, it was when I was a grad student and I was working on a machine and one of my my lab mates forgot to to not electrify something and I uh, there was a wire that was exposed and I was um, I had a wrench and I was turning the the screws on something the the wrench touched the wire and which completed the circuit and I was holding the wrench and it was a thousand volts. And so that's greater than 60 volts. And I remember I screamed really loud, it hurt. And I felt like someone punched me in the chest. I found out later that was my heart seizing, but I mean, I, I didn't defibrillate. I mean, the problem with you do that, you can, your heart can stop, you can defibrillate. And I mean, I screamed so loud that someone and in the lab across from me came over to check on me, you know, kind of thing. And, and the nice thing about a lot of, a lot of electricity, if, I mean, the, it was low current, so I didn't have to worry about a burn. I didn't have any burns on my hand or anything, but it, it kind of gave you quite a jolt. And if you can, if you can talk and your, your heart is working fine, you don't have any burns that are visible externally, you're most likely fine. So I didn't go to the hospital, maybe I should have, but you know, I, I was fine, you know, kind of thing, but we need both. Yes. I mean, that's, that's what they say is amperage kills you. Uh, amperage alone won't kill you, but voltage beyond 60 plus amperage will kill you. So you have to overcome the, um, the insulation nature of the human body. So under so other, I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's 60 is a, is a guess though. Like maybe if like, if you're soaking wet and you're, you know, full of salt, like say I'm, I'm uh, working on something and I'm really salty and sweat and, and I touch a car battery and then the current may not be able to throw flow through my body, but it could flow through the sweat coming from one arm to the other. And then as it's flowing, it can do resistance and do damage on the surface of my skin, you know, kind of thing. So it's, it's um, care and concern should always be taken when you're working electrical circuits. So, um, but yeah, and, but the, with electrical circuits at the same time, it is important that that flow happens. My, um, so my grandmother, she was swimming in a lake one time and it got struck by lightning. And, and she said she felt kind of a, like a kind of thing, but it didn't even really hurt. And I mean, a bolt of lightning, I mean, so uh, that's, that's huge potential. We're talking a hundred thousand volts and current of like a thousand amps. I mean, a bolt of lightning is just, it's a huge amount of electricity. So, and I mean, she was fine. She didn't even defibrillate kind of thing. She wasn't even close to defibrillating. I guess you could have. I mean, obviously survived. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here, you know, kind of thing. So now, if she was like standing on, if she was swimming. I mean, maybe if she was standing on the shore, maybe the current could have. But she wasn't struck directly, and it was it was fresh water too. So fresh water doesn't conduct as well as say like salt water. So, I mean, uh, but either way, she wasn't grounded. Um, so I mean, if she were grounded, then then the electricity could have flown through her to the ground. So, I mean, so being grounded is not always a good thing. So there are certain circumstances, like you're swimming, swimming in a body of water and struck by lightning, it's better to not be grounded. So, but that's just some of the basics of, uh, I just wanna talk a little bit about the basics of electricity. Anybody other questions about kind of basis of electricity, what it means. And, and so among other things, that, uh, so what's the, the take home message of my, my short soliloquy tirade? 
Um, battery, battery is the source of the positive charge and the positive charge flows towards the negative in a circuit diagram. It's really the electrons we'll talk about soon. Uh, the current, the current is the amount of charge that flows. The potential, the voltage, I'm even using the word potential. The voltage is the charge per, is the energy per charge. So it's how much energy it has. So let's go back to this battery. So uh, we have this battery and this is a standard cell. So we have uh, zinc attached to copper. And in this case, the copper, the copper metal is the cathode, it's a source of positive charge. And zinc is the anode, it's a source of negative charge. Uh, what Ben Franklin told you is wrong. It's not the positive charges moving, it's the negative ones. So when we connect up this, this voltaic cell, this galvanic cell, we have a strip of zinc on the anode, a strip of copper on the cathode, one molar of, uh, or one mole per liter of zinc ions, one per molar, one, one molar of uh, copper ions, and we connect the two metals with a wire. So, and the wire is allowing the electrons to flow. And the idea is that the electrons flow from the negative anode to the positive cathode. And will the electrons just randomly flow from one metal to the other? If that happens, you will get a buildup of positive charge. So the, the zinc will give its electrons over to copper, which means then the zinc will have a buildup of positive charge, and then the copper will have a buildup of negative charge. You're not going to get a buildup of charge just randomly. So you have to have something to counteract the flow, the, the, the charge. And that's why we have what's known as a, a salt bridge. So a salt bridge, you have uh, an area where ions can travel. So when you have the electrons go from the zinc metal and they travel over to the copper metal, as the electrons leave the zinc, the zinc loses an electron, and then the zinc ion, it goes from zinc metal to zinc ions, in this case, zinc plus two. So zinc gives two electrons, zinc metal gives two electrons and turns into zinc ions. And then the electricity flows and it goes to the copper. The copper ions, the copper plus two ions gain two electrons and become copper metal. And if this were to happen, uh, just as I've described it, you will get the, the, um, the zinc anode will start to become positively charged and then the cathode will start to become negative charged. So what happens is we, between these two solutions, you have to have what we call a salt bridge so that negative ions can flow towards the, um, the positive, uh, side will become what the well, negative ions will flow towards the these the up and coming positive charge and positive charges flow towards the generated negative charges. So, uh, and this is a salt bridge, and which also means if you remove the salt bridge, you break the circuit. Without the salt bridge, the electrons won't flow. And uh, we'll talk about standard cell potentials soon, uh, not this class, but the, the potential uh, for uh, zinc uh, becoming zinc ions, the potential to draw this, this is positive 0.76 volts. So positive 0 0.76 joules per coulomb. And copper, Copper ions, copper plus two ions, accepting electrons become copper metal. The potential for this is 0 0.34 volts, 0 0.34 joules per coulomb. Which means if I have this circuit, uh, then, then this circuit will produce a potential of 1.1 volts. 
So if I were to have, uh, uh, I mean, I in the the book has it in the image. It has a, a light bulb, so it's it's using the work to draw a light bulb. If I had a a voltmeter, I would see a charge of 1.1 volts, 1.1 joules per coulomb. So uh, one thing with this potential, the potential for this is an intrinsic variable. Intrinsic means not depending on the size. So density, density is an intrinsic variable, right? So uh, or property, right? Because so water's density is one gram per milliliter. It doesn't matter if I have a raindrop. It doesn't matter if I have a liter of it. It doesn't matter if I have Lake Tahoe amount of water, right? So the amount of water, and I'm saying I'm like saying Lake Tahoe because it's fresh. I, I would normally say the ocean here, but you know, or how or Lake Superior or something, something big. Some Lake Superior, the water has the same density of all of Lake Superior. I, I mean, well, there's other stuff in there, but if it was pure water, that would density would be one gram per milliliter. Uh, same as a, a drop, same as water in my water bottle. All same density, which means also with potential, the potential of one zinc, the, the potential of one zinc atom going to one zinc ion is 0.76 volts, and the potential of 100 million moles of zinc metal going to 100 million moles of zinc ion is still 0.67 volts. And uh, that's because what drives it is what's known as the EMF or the electromotive force. So the EMF or the electromotive force is what drives it. Uh, what's driving it, uh, and this is not in the textbook, it's 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 a it's electromagnetism. It's it's actually a virtual photon. So it's photons that drive it, but the the photons disappear from atom. It, it, they go from atom to atom, and um, a photon a photon is the carrier of the electrostatic force. So the the uh, electricity and magnetism is carried by a photon. Photons move at the speed of light. So uh, and. Well, you think that what really carries the electromotive force, uh, the electrons, it's not the electrons, it's not the electrons, the, the force is carried by photons. And that's why electricity moves at the speed of light. So electrons, so if, uh, if you think, okay, how fast, so when I, when I, when I do this circuit, you know, and, you know, how fast here is my zinc metal, how fast is this electron going to move from zinc metal to the copper metal? How fast is that thing moving? And, and I remember uh, in, in my electricity and magnetism class, I raised my hand, I'm like, it's going 99.8% the speed of light. The teacher goes, wrong, 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 wrong. The electrons on average move about 10 to the minus five meters per second. So it depends on the circumstance. So 10 to the minus five, you know, that's what, 10, 10 micrometers? You know, that's really slow. Really, really slow. The electrons themselves, I mean, like, I guess they're moving quickly, but if you look at their linear velocity, like as they move across a wire, the electrons are moving exceedingly slow. So, I mean, when, when I was learning this stuff, I thought that like, I thought the electrons are flying everywhere. I was just like, isn't it cool electricity? You have the electrons like, pew, like they're just flying all over the place. And really the electrons, they just kind of, they just kind of move back and forth and they like, slowly meander. They, they uh, you can force them to go in one direction, like alternating current. So alternating current, they just go back and forth. They're like, I'm going this way, I'm going this way, I'm going this way, I'm back this way. So alternating current, they're just kind of just kind of doing whoop, 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 whoop. That's what they're doing in, in AC circuits. A direct current, like a battery, batteries are all directional. They're not moving that fast. They're just kind of moving slowly, but 
why when I flip on the light switch, do the lights turn on, you know, within the speed of light when the circuit is connected? It's because the, the, the potential, the joules per coulomb of, of, of the electrons, this is moving in between them via photons and photons move at the speed of light. So the photons, they, the, the carrier, the electromotive force, this is moving at the speed of light. So electricity does go, the electricity does work at the speed of light, but the electrons themselves are not moving that fast. So uh, also with this, elect the electromotive force and the, the intrinsic nature of, uh, of voltage. Uh, so here is a little dinky thing. So this is, you know, a beaker. So I have a strip of zinc, I have a beaker, I have another beaker with a strip of copper, a solution of copper, and I have a salt bridge. So I have, it can be, it's potassium nitrate written in this, but it could be anything really, any, anything that's ionic, that's soluble. And a little stopper that lets ions pass. Um, so let's say like, hey guys, let's do something really cool today. What if I went and dragged one of those outdoor pools, you know, and I had an outdoor pool and I, Brought to the parking lot. Well, I brought two of them. So I, I bring two outdoor pools and then I put, you know, I make a one molar zinc nitrate solution. And then I, I somehow get like a, a Nissan Sentra sized piece of zinc. Same thing, Nissan Sentra sized piece of copper, fill that full of, of one molar copper nitrate, you know, and then I take this huge tube and fill it full of potassium nitrate or something else, sodium chloride, whatever, something that can ions can flow. Like, I guess sodium chloride wouldn't be good because it would cause precipitates. So, so I guess no, I guess zinc chloride and copper chloride. So I guess sodium chloride would work. And then I, you know, take these huge cotton balls and put them in the end of the salt bridge and I stick that in the, um, into the, the two, you know, mini pools and, and I got my, and I, I take a, a wire and a big thick wire, I attach it to the zinc. I take a big thick wire, attach it to the copper. And I say, hey guys, you know, wonder what's gonna happen when I take these two thick wires, you know, and I connect it to my, my voltmeter with this, you know, three tons of zinc and three tons of copper in this, you know, thousand gallons of solution this huge salt bridge, what do you think is going to be the potential when I put this? It's going to be a huge potential. And I'm all scared. And I put it together and it goes 1.1 volts. I'm like, wah, wah, wah. You know, it doesn't matter the size. So the, the, the amount of energy that's available in the zinc metal going to zinc ions and then copper ions going to copper metal, the amount of energy that's available in this transfer of electron activity is the same no matter how much you, you put in. So what would be the purpose of having that, you know, two standing pool, you know, car size hunks of metal battery, it would just last a long time. This is, that would, that, that battery would spit out 1.1 volts for a very, very, very long time. So that's the only thing that would, that would be the difference, would be time. Because then, because there's more metal and more ions available. Uh, later on though, uh, you might notice that as your batteries are dying, the voltage changes. Um, we'll talk about that in, 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 uh, in uh, a couple of lectures. Uh, that's because uh, the solution concentration changes. So, the standard cell potential is at, at one molar. If you change the concentration, you change the voltage. So, and uh, we'll talk about that, the effects of that later on. So, but that's, we're starting off with the standard cell potential. And, uh, oh, and I didn't mention this equation here, the, the standard cell potential, so the E0, the, the standard potential, is going to be the potential of the anode and the potential of the cathode. And uh, so how do you remember which one's the anode and which one's the cathode? So, so for me, I remember it by, um, 
I, I remember by anode corrodes. So uh, also with uh, like let's let's look at this this uh, battery as you turn it on, you wait for a long, long time. What's going to happen is the zinc anode is going to corrode. The zinc, the zinc is a source of negative charge, a source of electrons. The metal is going to corrode away and turn to ions. So the anode corrodes, and then the cathode, the cathode is the source of positive charge. So the negative electrons go. It takes the positive charge away from the copper, copper ions, the copper metal. The cathode gets fat. So the cathode grows. Anode corrodes, cathode grows. So for me, myself, the way I remember it is anode corrodes. So yeah, question. Which kind of battery? The, the alkaline batteries. So it's not going to be acid that comes out. Uh, there's a lot. I mean, there's there's no simple way. The, the question the question is why do batteries leak as they start to get old? There's there's no simple answer to that because there's different types of alkaline batteries. Um, the most common type is um, zinc with potassium uh, hydroxide going through it. It's just um, the the uh, the alkaline the the potassium hydroxide tends just to eat through things over time. Uh, it's more it's more of a um, it's more of a time in a in a very corrosive environment kind of thing. So then then uh, then actually the because when you say acid, it makes me think of a, a lead acid battery that's a car battery. So but um, but yeah the uh, and also the other thing is that when, when batteries, the, the alkaline batteries die, when they usually die, it's the, the zinc, the, the alkaline batteries are, are zinc. Um, the, the outside of them are, are lined with zinc and uh, the inside is a carbon rod. Um, so you have a shell of zinc on the outside. When the zinc all goes away, um, that's when the battery dies. And then you, then you have, uh, they have potassium hydroxide. The alkaline is the potassium hydroxide in the battery. Then that can that can further corrode the the inside of the battery because like a, uh, the the when the zinc metal all goes away, when the battery is dead or die and there'll be patches where it's open, then the, the potassium hydroxide can then attack the other metal, which is usually something like iron or aluminum. So probably more more often iron. So so it's a combination of the what's um, uh, known just plain old corrosive nature chemistry and also um, it's called a sacrificial anode in this case it's the actual anode uh, the it's a way to prevent corrosion but when the anode goes away the the um, the corrosion starts attacking other things in this case will be the, the 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 casing of the battery itself and then if that if it eats through that then yeah you get the leaky stuff so don't don't touch that and rub your eyes so, because that's potassium hydroxide, among other things. So, and uh, uh, if, you, if you do have it leak and you damage your circuits, uh, one of the things that can help you get rid of that is vinegar. So I've, um, I've reclaimed some old um, uh, what are, uh, calculators by taking the batteries out. Like, you know, the, the graphing calculators, you know, I, um, I had one that was, I <clears throat> let sit too long and the battery started leaking and it, and it corroded the terminals. I, uh, if you take vinegar and you can rub it on there, it even, it even sizzled, um, you can get rid of the, uh, the base and remove. And the, so uh, acetic acid, acetate is very soluble. So if, you, if you're careful enough, you can lift a lot of those metals and solubilize them. And, and expose the, 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 the wires enough that it'll work again, maybe. So be careful with that. But um, as you're doing that though, remember that, that the battery parts, those are, those are pretty, pretty um, caustic. It's potassium hydroxide. So I guess I don't, don't touch that and rub your eyes. 
So does that answer your question or? Yeah, okay. Yeah, as you know, I give dollar answer to nickel questions. I guess the, the short answer is it corrodes. The potassium hydroxide just eats the shell from the zinc going away. Okay, and did I cover everything? Yeah, I guess I did for that. And uh, so also with this, the, uh, the potential then for the, for the electrons leaving the zinc, going to zinc ion, uh, you can see that it's plus 0.76. It's going to be different potential, different potential. Stop moving. It's going to be different potential for different metals and different ions. So depending on what your metal is, depending on what ion is in solution, and what's what the what's it's going to which ion the the metal going to which ion also which ion is then going to metal. These these things are all um, uh, the. The, the numbers change, the meaning the, the potential changes, the voltage changes. And uh, there are certain rules when it comes to, to voltage. Uh, you can have batteries and cells in series. And if you do that, the potentials add. So um, a car battery, for instance, is a 12 volt battery. It's actually six different cells that are two volts a piece. So the lead acid uh, batteries, each cell, is it has a potential of two volts. And if you connect one in series, then, then the two volt, then they just add. So you, you add two volts for each one. So a 12 volt battery has six two volt cells. If you wanted a 20 volt battery, you'd have to have 10 two volt cells. So stacking onto each other. So, uh, so if you're wondering how, you get, how we get more voltage out of things, it's because you have uh, just them uh, stacking up on uh, top of each other. Uh, so what we're going to go over also for the next couple of classes, we're just going to deal with metals. Uh, we will talk briefly about other types of batteries like fuel cells and lithium ion and uh, uh, batteries. So um, those, those work a little differently. The same principle is still electromotive force. But for, for, um, for fuel cells, we have a combustion reaction driving the electron flow. And uh, for lithium ions, you have a lithium ion moving from one spot to the other. Uh, and and they have the electromotive force drives, well, it, as, the, as the, the, the ion, the lithium ion moves from one spot to the other, it, it, um, it releases energy in, in this form of, of electromotive force in the form of electricity. So. Uh, that's what we'll get to, uh, but we'll start off talking about metals. And I'm trying to wrap things up because I know I have a minute left of class. So, okay, so that's what we're talking. Okay, class, my shut up alarm should be going off any second. There we go. There's my shut up alarm. Okay. Anybody have any questions? All right. See, can I ask you any questions?